Welcome to One Million Cups. Great to have you here. We got lots of seats up front, so come on up. How many of you are here for the first time? Excellent. Did you bring, any, who, who brought a friend today? Excellent. <laughs> Nobody actually raised their hand, but you guys didn't notice that until I said that. Um, my name is Brian Azorski. Jason Kerrigan, Melissa Roberts, we are your volunteer organizers, and we've got an exciting program for you today. Hand it off to Melissa. Yeah, so um, you guys may not know this, but it's our birthday today. <laughs> Happy birthday to us. You can sing to us later, don't worry. Um, so today is the two-year anniversary of One Million Cups. We've got a very special show for you today. Um, our two original One Million Cups presenters are here to, to give us an update on uh, how their companies have grown over the last two years. They've both been incredibly successful in their own ways. Um, and so a couple of things that you may not know about One Million Cups, hopefully you know. Um, we're in 32 cities around the country. We've got teams of organizers that do a lot of volunteer work in every single one of those cities, um, like we do here in Kansas City. Um, so we want to wave to them, give them a shout out. Some of them are, are watching, some of them are busy right now. Um, but we also have a great team of people behind us that make us look really good every week um, here at the Kauffman Foundation. So we want to say thank you uh, to all the Kauffman Associates and all the other staffers here at the foundation um, that help us get the presentations loaded and get us live streaming and take pictures and just generally make us look awesome. So thank you very much, guys. Cool. It's been a great two years. So, without further ado, we're going to bring up Tom, um, who you have probably seen here before, to introduce our first presenter. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, or I should say, happy birthday. It's a auspicious occasion here at the Kauffman Foundation. A little over two years ago, we were in the process of reconstituting what the entrepreneurial portfolio here at the Kauffman Foundation should look like. And one of the things that we made a very significant commitment to was to be true to Mr. Kauffman's intentions, to really re-engage and reconnect the community with the foundation in a meaningful way that could bring value to the people that he cared about so much. So we started doing some things in Kauffman Labs, offering courses and a variety of things that hopefully many of you here in the audience have had a chance to partake in. And we started this little thing called One Million Cups. And boy, did we start something good. I am so proud of what uh, we've accomplished with this. And my team is probably sick of hearing me use uh, parenting metaphors, but I can't help it. I'm a parent of three exceptional children. And I feel like I'm a parent of an exceptional team here. And the thing that we learned with this One Million Cups experiment of ours is that communities can come together and support each other. And as a proud parent, when you see your kids coming together and working together and helping one another, it's a very special and proud moment. And that's one of the big takeaways that uh, I have from this program that in now almost three dozen communities around the country, people are coming together to take care of each other in many, many ways that have had direct material impact in those communities. And it all started here, which is something that I hope you share my pride in, in knowing that. So it is on this great two-year anniversary that we thought we would revisit where it all started with two great entrepreneurs that helped us kick it all off. And Michael and Kirk, uh, I don't know, I guess, I don't wanna say I'm your daddy, but staying with that metaphor, I'm immensely proud, and I know others are too, uh, of what you have accomplished in that very first day when there was like a dozen of us over in Kauffman Labs, practically by ourselves, to where you are today. So I'm very excited to bring you up on stage. Kirk, why don't you come on up here and kick us off in, in sharing what you've done in the last couple of years. Oh, you got that? Put a mark. I appreciate the opportunity. I, I was telling Mike that I kind of look at it as a badge of honor that, that Rarewire was one of the first companies on the first day to, to get to present at One Million Cups. So it's been an exciting couple of years. So I'm going to give you guys an update on what we've been up to. 
So this actually, we found, we dug deep, this is actually a picture of that very first day, which it's kind of cool, and you can see how sparse the crowd was. I th- you know, the way I remember it is, Nate was calling some people down, some employees of Kaufman saying, hey, come check this thing out we're trying to do, and they're like, why are we here? What is going on? What is this thing? And, and look at what it's become now, two years later, it's exciting. Um, Rarewire, for some of the new guys that don't know, Rarewire is a mobile app development studio. It's a software that we invented to make it easier to build apps on the iPad. Building apps is hard. You gotta be a hardcore programmer writing code. And so we invented a software that makes that easier. And the last couple years has been kind of a whirlwind. A um, Couple years ago, we got picked as a finalist, a startup of the year for Silicon Prairie News. We lost to Douala, which is, I'll take that any day, they're, they're an exciting company. Uh, last year, we were the Entrepreneur of the Year for the Kansas City Economic Development Council and, and also picked as one of the 15 hottest mobile companies by the Next Web Conference in New York and actually won their hackathon when we were up there. So that was, that was pretty fun. Um, over the past couple years, we've built hundreds of apps, and this gives you a quick sample of some of the clients we've been fortunate enough to work with. Uh, so it's, a, it's an exciting new market. I was telling Tom before we started today that we were all excited about starting this company and it really was spawned because this new thing called the iPad was coming out and, and Flash wasn't going to work on the iPad and so we thought we had this idea that we could make it software to make that easier. But we had no idea that the iPad was going to become as big as it became. And so, you know, one of the fortunate things of starting a company is we ended up starting it in a market that is a hundred billion dollar market. So it creates a lot of opportunities for us. Uh, what we've been up to since then in the last couple of years, number one, we, as you can imagine, we get calls all the time for people with ideas about apps. But we also have our own ideas. So for a long time, we never had enough time to do our own ideas. So about nine months ago, we decided, hey, let's do one of our own ideas. So we built this app called Spine. And Spine is a social media app, kind of like Twitter or Facebook or um, Flickr or whatever it may be, except it's for short story writing. So we had this idea to create an app where you could write short stories and creative writing, create a social media account, follow your friends, follow writers that you like, favorite stories, things like that. So we launched that a while ago, and we actually shot a documentary about the process of building that that turned out pretty cool as well. So if you, if you enjoy short story writing or reading, you ought to check that app out. It's kind of cool. It's free. Another thing we've done is early on in the, in the app world, the kind of low-hanging fruit was publishers, where all the magazines were trying to figure out how to build apps. And so our first client ever was the Atlantic Magazine. But we quickly realized that a bigger opportunity was coming in the enterprise, and all these companies we're slowly adopting the iPad and going to want to figure out how to build apps to take advantage of, of this new device. And so we decided about a year ago that we were going to do a really robust integration with Salesforce. And so we built out this mobile solution that makes it really easy for a Salesforce administrator. If you guys are familiar with Salesforce, it makes it really easy to point and click your way through a, a Salesforce plugin and dynamically define what data you want to feed out to an app. And so to keep the story short, we are working with Salesforce and have a lot of exciting things brewing on that. And we just got approved as an app in their app exchange market about a month or two ago. So now we're out taking it to market and selling it. And the, the response and the level of interest has been unbelievable. So it's just a matter of trying to figure out how to get it out there. It's, but it's exciting. Uh, What's coming next for Rarewire? What, I, what we're calling, we haven't given up on the name yet, so we're calling it 2.0. Um, the best analogy I can give you guys is if you're familiar with Tumblr, it's like Tumblr for native mobile cross-platform apps. It's, there's a lot of opportunity out there in the world for small businesses who everybody wants an app for their business. It's kind of like the internet boom of the 90s where Everybody said, what's this thing called a website? Hey, maybe we should build a website for our church or our little league or our, our small business. Same discussions now are happening about apps. And, but the reality is, 
Susie's Bakery isn't going to go spend 20 grand or 30 grand or 50 grand of the cost to build an app. And so what we built is it's 2.0 version of our platform where now you don't even have to learn our wire language. Now you can go, you'll be able to go through a library of pre-built templates and pick the one you like and very easily point and click and build an app. Some of you might be saying there's already things out there like that. What's different about what we're doing is we have the robust engine and platform and language underneath the cover. So now you can hit a button and if you want to, peel back that XML base and see that XML based language where you could easily tweak it. So again, just like Tumblr. And then we also have visions of creating a marketplace like Tumblr so that anybody could go build their own templates and put them up there for sale and make money off of that. So we're really excited about that. Rather than having to learn the There's a little video about it. 2.0 introduces the concept of app templates. Templates essentially allow developers to take the work that they've done and make it so that anyone can easily fill out a couple of forms and then customize that baseline app to produce any types of new and different customizations that the 2.0 user would like to apply. We envision 2.0 to en enable an entire marketplace of templates that are being built by our developers. So this is the first time actually anybody's seen this yet. It's still been on their cover, so it's kind of a feel for what it's going to look like, and, and we're pretty excited about it. And these are a couple bullet points, obviously, to give you an idea of what's going to happen. The other thing that's coming out that I'm even more excited about, and I don't know if you guys have read this recently, is Apple just announced in iOS 7, and they already worked on Android, the ability to work with this, these new things called iBeacons. And it's, a, it's basically a new Bluetooth standard where you can get these hockey pucks that send out a Bluetooth signal. And now you can build an app so that the app walks by a 50 yard range of a hockey puck and it triggers a signal to the app to do something. So you think about shopping experiences where you walk into a store and you walk up to a stand of clothes and it says, hey, here's the, you know, I'm, one of our clients is Forever 21 that I'm pitch, pitching this to, so it's like, hey, here, you're looking at these blue shorts, well, if you don't have your size, just click here and we'll ship it to your house tomorrow. Or if you're walking through a museum and you're looking at a piece of art and the Bluetooth signal triggers your, your app of the museum to play you a video about the history of Leonardo da Vinci or whatever it may be, the, the possibilities are endless. So again, I have a little video to give you an idea. Smart beacons present relevant information to your device based on the context of where you are. <clears throat> now in Android and iOS 7, your device scans for any nearby beacons in the background as you move around. And when you want info about something you're near, it's ready to swipe on your notification screen. So if you take out your phone as you pass a new restaurant, you can see their lunch specials or menu reviews. Since your phone knows that you just arrived at the table with the red beacon, the menu will be ready when you pick up your phone. So if you're in a hurry, you can send your order straight to the kitchen. You can have beacons at home too. So if your context is the kitchen and you're near the fridge, your shopping list will be ready and waiting when you look at your phone. And then when you walk by the beacon in the dairy aisle, your phone can give you a reminder to make sure you don't forget to pick up milk. And because the range awareness for beacons is sensitive down to a few inches, it can tell what you're closest to or what product you pick up. So when you look at your phone, it'll already show product information or let you know if your size is in stock or let you see what other colors are available. And then you can order it right from your phone. And if you've been at the restaurant for a while, your phone will be ready if you want to order another drink or pay the check with the push of a button. Your phone is always with you. Smart beacons, give it some context. So this is a company, just to explain this, this is the company that makes the hockey pucks that we're partnering with. So we're going to be able to offer the total package, not just the hockey pucks, but the software platform to build the app to make all that work. And then also the back end dashboard panel to manage what message is related to what hockey puck and so on and so forth. So it's nothing new that we invented. It's a new thing that's on the market. What's unique about what we're doing is we offer, I think we're going to be one of the few, if not only that I know about, to offer the total package of the platform and the hardware behind it. So it gives you kind of some of the ideas. And that's about it. The last thing I'd want to say is thank you to Kaufman. They've been an incredible help and an incredible resource to me as an entrepreneur and to Rarewire as a, as a startup company. 
in so many facets, I can't even begin to explain. And, and so I would just challenge you guys to take advantage of the fact that they're here in Kansas City because we're lucky to have them. And, and I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. Questions for Kurt? Right. Kurt, great job, my friend. Uh, question, um, curious to get your thoughts on app overload. Uh, so clearly everyone's, like you said, doing apps, people want apps. Um, but they take storage space, they, they drain your battery because they're doing notifications and stuff. Is it necessary that churches and everyone has an app, or are there certain cases where not so much? You know, I would say that people are still figuring that out. And just like you, I assume, and I, I download apps all the time, and I check them out once, and I'm done, and I delete it, or what have you. So it's it's, this, it's still the same analogy of a website. People went out and spent $100 on a website and a million dollars on a website, and you find your favorite websites that you like, and those are the ones that have success and, and you use. It's, it's a new tool. It's a new platform that, and a new, new media that didn't exist. So what I'm seeing is uh, back in the, in the small business world, in the enterprise, there's unbelievable opportunities and creative things happening for companies to figure out how to use those. We're working on a deal, as one example, we're working on a deal with a pump company who normally sent out a guy to inspect these $100,000 pumps at wastewater treatment plants. And he'd have a clipboard filling out paper and he'd had his crappy little camera, he'd take a picture of the pump or whatever. Well, we're doing a big project to turn that into an app. So now instead of filing all this paperwork and have to do order entry and deal with all that nightmare, now it's just an app where a guy has a tablet in the field, he inputs the report, it's fed right back to a database. Now that database is searchable and pull analytics on it. And so opportunities like that are, are happening like crazy. I tell people all the time, but, but your point is exactly right. I, we get calls all the time about app ideas. I, my answer is I can build anything you want. So if I handed it to you tomorrow, now what are you going to do with it? The key to figure out today, it's not like the early days where there, it was just starting. Now there's millions of apps out there. So how are you not going to get lost in the shuffle? So it's almost as important, if not more important, to have a good plan of how you're going to get it out there and be creative and do something different. One of, one of our, another example is one of our clients is Boulevard Brewery. And if you're just going to go replicate your website, don't, don't waste your time building an app. But they had this creative idea that we loved is they built a beer finder app. So it wasn't their website, it was just a new little marketing tool and gimmick where using the GPS functionality of the device, when you're walking through town, you can pull it up and say, hey, I like 80 acre wheat and show me where it is and, and it would show you a, a map, an interactive map of locations, bars, restaurants, liquor stores, you can go find that beer. So just creative little marketing tool. So you're right, you still have to come up with a good idea uh, and if you're just Gonna go replicate your website, it's not worth doing. Got a question right here in the middle. Hey Kirk, I, fib. I already asked you about Windows Phone app, so I'm gonna shift gears. Um, with the smart beacons, apps and dating sites has a huge market, so I, if you could leverage that to do smart beacons to find your profile as you're passing through uh, Westport or the plaza, <laughs> you'd be onto something. <laughs> you know, it, like I said, I can, I, I can build anything. So it, it, it's, it comes up to creative ideas like that, but it, the, I'm really excited about that, that Beacon thing because it's going to create a whole new experience that makes it really easy to do things like that. That it, It's, it's going to be a fine line of becoming invasive, and consumers will say, oh, turn that off, that thing's sending me stuff. But people are also going to come up with some really creative and cool ideas on how to use that. So it's, it's absolutely possible. Kirk, we have a question way back in the back. I first met you at uh, Futurelia a few years ago, how has your international business taken off? <clears throat> you know, not as well as I'd like. You know, it's, for us, it's all about resources and strategic partnerships and trying to find the right companies to work with to get that kind of exposure. But, I actually, but we get phone calls all the time. One of the things that was really cool about Rarewire a, a little while ago is we somehow were lucky enough to get an article written about us in Forbes magazine. Um, and so that created a number of 
leads and opportunities that came in because of that article where I actually got a phone call one time from Dubai about uh, building an app for a kind of a concierge app for a patient surveys for a concierge hospital in Dubai. So the opportunities definitely come at us, but I'm, I'm you know, one of the things I got to figure out is how to take bigger advantage of that because there's a lot of opportunities out there that we haven't tapped into yet. We have a question here in the middle. Uh, Aetna Life Insurance, uh, a few years ago, started a website in which they vetted and then made downloadable uh, apps relating to wellness, fitness, and healthcare. Uh, and a statistic I heard from them once was that uh, they had in one year, I think this was a couple years ago now, it's probably a lot more now, something like seven million hits, <laughs> downloads for their wellness apps, fitness apps, and maybe a million, if that, for their fitness apps. Are you, or, I'm sorry, for their healthcare apps. <clears throat> uh, are you at all involved in, in doing healthcare apps? And if, if so, or even if not, what do you, what kinds of opportunities are you aware of going on for apps in the healthcare space? So the first thing I would say is we, we look at it as it's a gold rush and Rarewire is the one selling the shovel. So we don't specialize in a specific industry in a niche. Having said that though, yes, we are working on or have worked on or know about a number of opportunities in, in the healthcare space. That's a huge space that is also taking on the mobile, this mobile world of today. So a couple of examples. We built an app for a company <clears throat> that is a patient survey app where you walk into the doctor's office to register and instead of them handing you a clipboard, they hand you an iPad. And, and you fill out your form and we, did, we built it out with all the HIPAA compliance so that's, gets, that data gets sent back to the doctor's electronic medical record software. The cool part about that app though was one of the partners in it was Hearst Publishing. And so after you click submit and it, the form goes away, a magazine rack of 10 magazines like GQ and Cosmopolitan comes up so you have the iPad in there and you can sit there and peruse the magazines. There's a patient education section so if you're in having knee surgery you can watch a video about the rehab process or whatever it may be so that's a cool one um, there's another company here in town another startup called minute movement that's a kind of a preventative care exercise app that we're talking to those guys and trying to hopefully get a chance to help them build that out um, and then another one we're working on that we're getting ready to start building is a preventative what, what's the oh, health and well it's exactly what you said it's a health and wellness app where it's all about input and data and forms where these companies go out to an employee and say, hey, we're gonna do these, these uh, screenings of employees and take your blood pressure and weight and height and do, you know, where the healthcare companies do, come out to your companies and do that. So we're building an app to help that process and collect all that data and manage that. So I guess my general answer is yes, we're involved in that. We don't focus on that as a company, but we have clients and opportunities coming in and there's a bunch of stuff happening in that space. Kurt, I have a question up front. Tell us more about the Studio 2.0 and how the pricing works for that. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> the, uh, you know, pricing is always a struggle because there, there's, there's so many opportunities and so many players and, and it's a big strategic question to try to decide and I don't know that I claim that I got it right or not, but here's what, here's what we're thinking. Um, on the 2.0 and the template process, our goal is to keep it really low cost. Because it's fully automated, there's not really work in it for us now that we've built the platform out. So our, our price point is where if we go build an app for a church or for a restaurant, our price point is gonna be $25 a month to go on and point and click your way through and build an app and put it out there in the market. Now, if you wanna get into highly customizing it, then that opens up you know, the cost to being anything you want. But, we think that there's a huge opportunity and niche in the marketplace of small businesses that, that we think we can go grab. So that's, that's our thoughts on that. Kirk, I have a quick question. As you guys have grown over the past few years, what have been the biggest challenges to your business growth and how have you overcome those challenges? <clears throat> um, probably the single biggest challenge for me is marketing and getting the word out there. I tell people all the time, 
that I think we got it. Our, our platform is badass. And I know about all the comp players in the market, and there's more and more coming every day, and I can tell you about every one of them and tell you why ours is better. And they're all different. But we got it. We, our technology team and our developers are unbelievable. The, some of the best in the country, not just Kansas City. And, the, and what we built is incredible. The thing I've struggled with is how do I get the word out there that we exist? And, and so I'm fighting that fight every day and trying to get better at that and, and get it out there. We've done a pretty good job, I think, in the Midwest and in the region. And Kansas City's been incredibly helpful in, in making that happen. And early on, our focus was we wanted to do our best in the local market. So now it's a matter of trying to expand that nationally. And that's what we're really focused on. And we think with this 2.0, it takes it to a whole new level of even easier to get exposure and get more people to sign up and consider using our platform to build their template. But that's probably been my biggest struggle. What, what's been the, your best success, what's, what's, what's been your most successful way of getting your word out? You said that's your biggest challenge, so what's, how have you done that successfully? It, it's a, it's a never-ending fight is the problem. So I've had successes like the Forbes story, for example. So working hard in the community and networking, going to events like this in Kaufman. So I, I think my biggest success is being involved in the community. And so that created a lot of opportunities for me that eventually I met a guy at Kaufman event that eventually said, hey, have you ever talked to the guy that writes for Forbes that lives here in Kansas City? And I was like, are you crazy? I didn't, the guy from Forbes lives here in Kansas City? No, I haven't talked to him. And yes, I want to talk to him. And it turned into an article. So that all so the success there was just getting out involved in the community and that turned into that opportunity. But guess what? A month later, all the hype from that story, you know, it, it, and so you gotta figure out how to do it again and keep that going and keep that momentum going. So it's a never, you, it's a never ending battle is the struggle. But that's, my, my general answer is the biggest success we've had, if you wanna call it success, is come from being involved in the community. Kirk, we got a question right here in front. Okay. With the $99 to publish, does then it go, an Apple app, does that go into the iTunes store under your developer registration, or can someone have their own Apple registration and publish it and price it? Right now, we have a platform and a language and a studio that you could open up and learn and design and build anything you want. And that, pro that has a couple different price points, $99 one-time build, or if you need the ability to update the app and, and change content on an unlimited basis, so if you're putting new content out or new game levels or whatever it is you build, then that's $250 a month. For that product, yes, you can put it in your own developer account. For version 2.0, with the ability to point and click your way through for 25 bucks a, a month, no, not yet. You can only do that. You can only submit that through our developer account. But that saves that saves the client that ninety nine dollar. Yeah, they don't have to. We're, that, that's a, exactly right. Our thought was a couple reasons, but one of the reasons is I don't want to have to have Joe's Bakery have to figure out how to go set up a developer account and pay the hundred dollars. They save a hundred dollars by set half hundred dollars a year to have to set up a developer account with Apple, where we can just take care of that for them. On the 2.0, $25 a month templated apps, yes. If you wanted to design and build, learn our wire language and build anything you want, then on that product you can put it to your developer account. Kirk, uh, we need to wrap this up, but before we go, you've got several hundred people in front of you and thousands and thousands on live stream. Obviously, uh, what can we do as a community to help Spread the word. You know, the simple answer is I would say give it a shot. If you're thinking about building an app, we've built apps for multi-billion dollar companies around the world. So our platform is very robust. There's still a learning curve like anything, but I think that if you give it a shot, you're gonna find that it might be easier than any other platform I know about out there to, if you're thinking about building your app. So I would say give it a shot and spread the word. Great, thank you. All right, now, before we get on to our second first presenter ever, 
Um, just want to bring up Scott from DST to make a quick announcement um, about the tech cocktail event that's coming up. Uh, there are a lot of other events happening, a lot of other opportunities for all the entrepreneurs in Kansas City. So check out the printed announcement sheets that are on your chair. And if you want to include an announcement in the future, uh, make sure you send your information to us before 2 p.m. on Monday. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thanks to Kaufman. Happy birthday. And uh, excited to be here. Um, I'm Scott from DST. Uh, we are sponsoring the uh, Tech Cocktail event next week, Tuesday night. 5.30 at the Boulevard Brewery. It's a great opportunity to come out and network, meet some people, kind of casual atmosphere. There's going to be startups there presenting their uh, story and what they're doing. Uh, they're sort of newer startups, um, early in their funding, so we're looking for investors, we're looking for interest parties um, to network and meet some uh, great people. So it's a nice relaxed atmosphere at the brewery. Uh, again, it's next Tuesday at 5.30. Uh, there's flyers around on some of the chairs. There's some flyers out on the table if you want to grab those. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Scott. Um, one other thing that I just remembered, sorry, guys, that's not in the announcements, is it's the middle of the Matt Fest, um, their forum event, as we announced last week, is happening this weekend. Um, so there's a lot of great panel discussions. Um, some really cool people are going to be speaking about, like, some startup us things. So it'd be cool to see you guys there. Um, so uh, without further ado, I want to bring up Mike and Tyler from Leap2, uh, now Leap It. Uh, they've been working on some really cool improvements um, and, present and presentations for their new product um, that's going to really revolutionize the way that search it, um, has developed over the last you know, 10 years. When you think about it, search has not changed at all since you know, the first kind of Google search bar came out. Um, and so they're really rethinking the way um, that our that our communities um, function, and that the that we share our perspectives when we're searching for different things. Sorry, that's as long as I can stall. <laughs> I was really trying, guys. Well, all right. So without further ado, <laughs> leap to uh, Mike and Tyler. Thanks, guys. Thank you for that standing ovation there, Adam. So, uh, Kirk, I got to thinking, if this is our third time here, and Tom is now our dad, I'm trying to figure out when we're going to get kicked out of the house. <laughs> so it's great to be back. Uh, we are Leap It. Uh, formerly, many of you notice, is Leap 2. My name is Mike Farmer. This is Tyler Van Winkle. I actually wrote my notes out this time because in past times I have a tendency to go off on a tangent and never give Tyler a chance to demo a product. <laughs> We've got something uh, very exciting to show you. We're actually using this platform as the opportunity to showcase something very new, something we actually have been working on for about uh, nine months. So two years ago, I was just thinking about it this morning uh, when presented at One Million Cups, you know, had a vision for a startup and I'm pleased to um, sort of announce or let you know that it feels like uh, we've actually started a movement. Uh, you will see a bunch of people with We Are the Algorithm t-shirts on. Uh, four weeks ago, we came out with the latest version of Leap.it. And we went to South by Southwest. And I think we were all completely blown away by the marketplace desire for an alternative for search. Uh, obviously, that's been our thesis when we went into this, and now that we are seeing sort of this passion for an alternative, we're all very excited about the potential that exists for LeapIt. So, we believe now is the time for a new search standard. If you think about it, uh, we have been living with blue links for about 12 years now. That experience is very much like going to a card catalog and being sent directly to a book, which certainly works in uh, some use cases. We think there's an opportunity to bring the human being back and bring human experience to the whole equation in an experience that's much more visual, dynamic, and, of course, uh, one that you can share with your friends. I ask you, does search accurately portray your professional experience when you go search your name on the web? Does search accurately portray Kansas City? When was the last time you did a search on Kansas City? 
How about Kansas City barbecue? Just give it a try sometime. This is our thesis, is that we believe that there is a better way to search, and we believe that that way that is better is that human beings should have a vote in all of this. We have been living with machine bench page ranking for far too long, and it has gotten us an incredible, uh, to an incredible place on finding information. But we think there's a final step that can be taken, and that is to bring human beings back into the equation, thus the, the we are the algorithm. So uh, I will also, I also want to mention that uh, just this weekend, uh, Seth Godin had a quote, and I just noticed it, and I want to read it to you. And, and if you all know Seth, he certainly is one of the leading thinkers as it relates to technology. He says, quote, discovery is what happens when the universe, organization, or friends helps you encounter something you didn't even know you were looking for. And he further went on in this blog post and he said he felt like this was a huge opportunity. This is precisely the opportunity we have sought out to address and we're gonna get into uh, uh, a demonstration. So let's go, first of all, and show you on the left is the search experience we've all come to know, and on the right is what we released three weeks ago. What we have done is made it much more visual. We believe we're in a visual sort of phenomena right now of, of everybody, you might know Pinterest, for example, coming to know information and, and visualizing. We've integrated uh, YouTube videos directly into the search. Uh, we've actually our algorithms are based on what's happening in real time. So you will see uh, Twitter results in there as well. And there's one other thing that you will see on that result set on the right, and it is in orange, and it's called a perspective. And that is precisely what we're talking about when we talk, we are the algorithm. Once we went to the card model, we realized that we could allow people to very quickly drag and drop and create the human curated search that they could then share with their friends. With that, I'm going to let Tyler get set up to go live with a demonstration. While he's setting that up, the interesting thing about our approach is uh, we are now hearing pretty consistently from thought leaders, venture capitalists, that this is the only conceivable way that they could think of that someone could actually go and move and share shift, market share, to actually turn it in turn search into a social network. So with that, Tyler. <clears throat> Excuse me, so I bet a lot of people are going, what is a perspective, right? Like human curation, search, this is all kind of in your face and mystical at the same time. So uh, what a perspective is, is what only us as humans know work together than a machine can ever figure out. So when we do keyword searches in Google, we kind of go through this problem solving set, right? We say, we're looking for Kauffman. And then we look at a couple of results and we go, oh, it's not Kauffman Stadium, we're looking for Kauffman Foundation. And we, and we query again, right? And then we query and query and query and we find these different sets. Well, we said, if, if we know how to do that, then we know how the results should come together. So when I go and I look for Kauffman, what I really want is a set of results that works together. It may be six keywords, it may be eight keywords, right? It, it may be one keyword but I want one place that I can come back and find that information or one place that I can send that information to a friend to help them discover the same thing that I'm looking for. So when you create a perspective in Leap, you're saying that these are the best set of results, this is my perspective on this keyword or on this topic, and if you log in, you can log in socially, so you can log in with Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. You can log in, you can actually let your trust networks know or your social networks, your friends know that this is your perspective and you can invite them in to help you create it and help you craft it. So anyone that you know can actually come in and contribute to your perspective alongside of you and then leverage their social network to come in and continue that perspective's growth. The, the best way to think about this is really think about your own professional career and you could take that example off of all the, you know, you may have education, you have to do a specific keyword search for that. You've got companies that you used to work for You've got maybe awards that you won, and none of those, so you in aggregate all of those different queries combined to come up with your 
professional perspective in that case. And our goal is to make it as simple as possible. So we said, you know, search is kind of the last piece of the internet that hasn't really caught up to speed with the rest of the web. So we wanted the easeability to create a perspective and the easeability to find information to match what the rest of the content on the web should be. So you can literally create a perspective, you can put it in the quick bar at the top, or, or you don't have to, there's a long form for it too, and you can drag and drop results onto whatever perspective it is that you're trying to create. So super fast, super easy, it shouldn't break the flow of work, everything works together. So that perspective gets created, your social network sees it, adds to it, comments on it, you get notifications for that, so thus is how we've created the uh, social network. Are we out of time? Yep, let's keep going. Let's go back to our friends. <laughs> right. we'll, I, I think we'll get into some Q&A, so we'll, we'll do a little bit more here just to, to wrap this up. I, Melissa asked you know, a little bit about uh, how we got here, so I wanted to touch on that. So Tyler and myself actually here in Kansas City, uh, going back about nine years ago, uh, took and created uh, a prototype that was voice search, did it on a phone, and um, we did that contextually 18 months before Google would do that. So we have been thinking about search for probably far too long. So Maybe not a healthy thing. Yeah, maybe not a healthy thing. So I, you know, to date, just a couple of stats or facts on us. Uh, we've raised $2.2 million. Uh, one thing uh, you know, on the next slide is our team. I want to just talk about is um, in startup world, they talk about is it better to be lucky or smart? And I absolutely, as the founder, can claim I got really lucky right here with this team, predominantly here in Kansas City. A lot of people know of them, know of their background. They have social media background, search background, and they have, they have been committed to us to the point to which uh, to the, to the leap cause to which we were actually in October of 2012, we were featured on the front page of the New York Times about how we were all working on and building this in a background. So I, you know, I can't thank these guys enough. A um, couple of other points. Uh, so we did a lot, you, you all have come to know us a lot with the mobile side with our app. Uh, we are working on some companion apps uh, to support the web version. Um, we had a big, going back right after One Million Cups presentation last year, we had sort of two major uh, ahas, if you will. The first was, because we went to the object-based results, the cards, the first was that we could turn search into a social network, and the second one was that uh, we could leverage the stream of real-time media, Twitter predominantly, and actually influence these uh, search results based on what's happening now. And what's really cool about that is that's a massive strategic gap that actually exists with some of the large uh, search providers. Um, just make one mention, uh, we released uh, and started a campaign, a very, very small campaign uh, to expose people to Leap It. Uh, I can tell you now we have had, uh, in three short weeks, we've had over 300,000 visitors. Uh, from all over the world, and uh, they are coming back, and they are actually staying on the site. So that first hook of, do we think we have created something and are on to something, the, the indications are very strong there. We're, everybody at Leaf's really excited about that. Of course, they're all trying to keep the servers up. But. And I think that's it. Search engine built in, here in Kansas City. We would ask, and we'll, we'll make this our ask as well. Uh, when I got up to present three years ago, I said, I think there's an opportunity to reinvent search, but the key element to this is could we turn Kansas City into a sounding board? And we now have the platform for that sounding board. So we'll ask you all, you know, to go home. Currently, we're predominantly on desktop. You can use it on your, on your phone through a browser. I ask you to sign in, log in, and create a perspective. Great, thank you. Questions? Got a question for you, right up here to your left. I guess my first question would be, with this new search engine and the content there, as a business owner, uh, how do I get in touch with you? How do I get started is with, this, with the SEO and all those things? You know, it's, it's interesting. I, this is absolutely the best first question, because 
you know, on one end, we can turn Kansas City into a sounding board. It's amazing the companies that feel like they've been, I don't know what the word is, compromised with you know, SEO and things like that, that want to come in and have a fresh start and go and create a perspective. So the short answer is you don't have to do anything except go to the site, go and create a bunch of searches. You will see the, the, all the different objects come in. Some are relevant, some are not. Combine them, put them into a single page, and then that site, anybody who searches, comes back. Anybody, any of our 300,000 people, if they search anything remotely close to that, could come up as a result. And that's one of the really powerful features of this is we're search-based, so any uh, algorithmic search, uh, anybody who's doing general web search will come across that. The other thing, in, and we're working on in a, in a couple of weeks, is we're working on a platform that will distribute search, so that then you will be able to take that, those objects and that, basically that page, and embed it onto your website. So it's SEO'd and it's got the social media engagement and tells you more about your company. We've got a question here in the center for you. As a pro uh, product of the 1950s, I'm generally super low-tech individual. I've really struggled with a lot of this. About five years ago, my husband and I decided we wanted to learn how to do Facebook. And so my daughter, Britton, took us to McDonald's down the road from us, and about three hours later, we were at each other's throats. And if we weren't adults, we would have probably been in tears. It ended up being pretty funny. A couple weeks ago, Britton took us out again, said, I want to do a tutorial for you on Leap It. And I have to tell you, that there was such a sense of euphoria. Five minutes into this tutorial, Larry and I really knew what we were doing. So engaging, so user-friendly. We have been using it ever since. Um, and I just want to say thanks to you all. What a phenomenon, and for making it um, adaptable to people in my generation that don't spend a lot of time with technology. Thank you. Thank you. Was that a paid? That was awesome. <laughs> I feel great. That's... But we had a, I, I will say this, we had a, um, gosh, I can't name any names, but some of the top companies uh, on the planet, brands that you absolutely know, and we had a search a head of search at one of the companies said that he's seen another search company attempt to do this and has been trying to do this for about three years. And I can tell you it wasn't easy. These guys were just insane over the last six months. The hours, you know, staying up and just, the, I mean, at each other's throat trying to figure out. There's so many nuances. There's so many subtleties. And, you know, the, I really appreciate that because of the work they've done because you look at it and it, it's almost like almost too simple. And, and that's really good design. It's, it's very, very complex stuff, though, going on there. Question up front. One of the things that's always been a problem with search is you've got people manipulating the system, playing games, you know, that sort of thing. So what is there on this that keeps somebody from doing that? I mean, you know, again, you've got the human element, but what prevents a huge company from, exa for example, hiring 1,000 people to start, you know, playing with the system? So how, how do you guys address that? You want me to take it? So, uh, a number of ways. We adhere and um, respect common SEO practice, but not necessarily click practice, right? So, page rank mechanisms are based on clicks, click throughs, track backs, all those kinds of things, and that's kind of where the authority system builds. Our authority system is based more on a real time basis. So, we'll take existing authority, authoritative sources and then build real time relevance on top of those. So, where a lot of that gaming was occurring by throwing, you know, tens of thousands of people at certain links and, <clears throat> excuse me, and then uh, pushing that link up the page because of it, that it's just not part of our algorithm necessarily. It's considered in our algorithm, but it's not the core, the core piece. You know, it's, it's interesting. I think that's one of our expectations is that uh, actually gaming will happen and people will come in and attempt to game the system. And I would offer you two things. First is, for us, it gets the engagement going. Internally, uh, within our office, our designer, before we went down to South by Southwest, I, I uh, created a perspective which was the ultimate guide to South by Southwest. And then he, uh, and a couple hours later, came out with the definitive guide to the uh, South by Southwest. Um, so we want that to happen to a certain degree. 
but the, I think one of the big things is in the world of sort of meta trends of what's happened in the internet, it's amazing how if you set these systems up that they're actually self-correcting. The community will self-correct and they will call it out. So, you know, as long as you leave it open, you know, if there's intellectual honesty, openness, and then transparency, uh, these, it's amazing how these type of systems, never, one's never been applied for search, but, I, you know, that's our, our hope. And that's, honestly, that's probably one of the most difficult discussions from a design perspective that we have internally. It's like, you know, you, we can see where this thing, people are going to game it and stuff like that. We're going to try to keep it as open as possible. We have a question here in the middle. Couple of quick questions. One, I, I hate to curse in the middle of your presentation, but the Google go-to-market, I understand, they're based on advertising. Tell us a little bit about your go-to-market. How does this end up making money? Eventually, it will be ad-based, but for now, we're you know we're starting with a fresh start, uh, as, as we like to refer to it for a, a search experience, and we're going to keep that uh, sort of running as long as we can. This is the uh, the dialogue I have perpetually with, uh, you know, what I consider people that are, uh, have much more experience and smarter than me, I, you know, a lot of times it's venture capitalists. It's like, you know, the sort of the Twitter or the Facebook question is how long do you run that until, you know, you have that critical mass. We have to get a critical mass of perspectives. But, uh, you know, without question, you know, we're going to, you know, we have to make some money somewhere and it will be uh, sponsored search. Um, it, you know, there's a lot of different things. Yeah. With, with as different and, as we like to think, innovative as kind of the front end of the system is, we think that maybe there's some new innovative monetization models that could exist down beneath the fold as well. And as people kind of hopefully start to come forward to work with us some more, we're going to be able to have partners to help us figure that out. There's also some uh, issues about privacy, about the previously named Evil Empire. Talk a little bit about how you guys are working with that. Um, so right now, we're not storing or collecting any information about the individual users whatsoever. So you can log in with your social network, and uh, we're going to go out and we're going to help you leverage your social network to invite your friends in to collaborate on these sources. Um, but we don't know who you are. We don't necessarily know who your friends are. All that is is a communications tool, and that's about as far as we go from a collection standpoint. Our hope is initially that, you know, as you all come to know Twitter, anything you put out there, it's, it's uh, open to the world. Mm -hmm. that we're going out with that. We've had a lot of requests for uh, creating private perspectives. That's on our product roadmap. But for now, we, you know, if the, the belief or the ethic is that um, if I create a perspective, it's going out to the public, then we just set that standard and that expectation. We've got a question to your left in the middle. Congratulations on what you've put together. Um, and it's a little bit of an adjunct to the question before. I found when Google first came out that it was a very intuitive option, different than AOL.com. And now we have your option. But what happened with Google is that it became that now when you search, the top is a box, which people have paid for that. The right are some boxes, which people have paid for that. And perhaps there is a way that when you look at um, building financial pieces, how you're going to make money, maybe there is also a perspective way or a totally different way of generating income. Because now Google has become, I mean, now your option seems a much better way to go, mostly because Google has become a you know revenue generating machine, but when it first came out, it was a very intuitive alternative. Which right now, that's what yours seems to be. So, uh, I guess the question is, um, you're going to have to make money. So, um, and you're saying you're going to deal with experts, but you, but the question would be, could you possibly take the same ideas as you've put together on this? and incorporate it into your fundraising idea or your ge revenue generation ideas. Definitely, and you know, I can make mention of this. We, we think where this evolves into are people who uh, really are subject matter experts or have really good experiences or create really good uh, perspectives and have significant following 
for this, that uh, there's an opportunity uh, in the realm of social currency. We've actually uh, already have drafted a, a provisional patent around that, that those people that actually have good answers, that we think there's an opportunity for them to be uh, potentially compensated. So if you look at the social nature of what we've set up, um, that's, you know, that's one of the reward places. And, but people would know that at the point that I was compensated for that perspective that I created, that it was, in fact, a sponsored you know, sort of perspective, if you will. Great. We've got a question here in the back. Hey guys, congratulations. Uh, I'm a Leapit user, lover, and I, I go wake up and I search the weather and I go to sleep and I you know, read some stories on it, love the product. Tell me two things, two questions. One is, can you talk a little more about your domain, how you got around the .it? A lot of the tech guys are like drooling over your domain. Uh, so talk a little about that. Second is, you know, I was at um, I was, I was Sprint Center at a game and when I was walking out, there was somebody handing out Leapit stickers. It's on my laptop uh, that says, hey, try out leap.it, what's your uh, client acquisition strategy? How are you trying to get from 300,000 to 3 million to 30 million? So uh, we bought the Leap domain from a guy in Italy, I guess. <laughs> uh, no, it, you know, we found it, we knew we wanted it. Um, the dot coms that we wanted to get were obviously way out of our price range, being a, a non-revenue generating startups. So Leap It was, was verbed and it worked. Um, we found it, it was an Italian owned domain for, from an, a guy in Italy and uh, we worked with some people here in town to, to work with a broker to get that bought and then transitioned over. So it, it honestly wasn't really as hard as we thought it was gonna be. I think on the, uh, and to answer your question on the customer acquisition, uh, we've actually got about three different pathways uh, that we will uh, use to get users. One is just straightforward baseline advertising on the web, either sponsored search advertising that. The second is um, actually going down a thought leader uh, influencer campaign. So imagine a, a sports enthusiast or an athlete who's you know maybe part of Nike, who wants to promote or, or create a perspective, or uh, we think there's a significant uh, opportunity there. Of course, tech tech leader, thought leaders uh, there as well. And then the third is this: um, go to market on the on the business development front with the widget. You know, w w when people see it and see how we're doing that, it's basically distributing search throughout the entire web. Uh, before we wrap it up, um, what can we as a community do for you? So please uh, go to Leap It. Uh, do a search for something that you're really interested in or for which you think you, you know, have some interesting knowledge, maybe a subject matter expert, maybe it's your own personal profile, and do a search and then just with the new version, you actually put your cursor right above, there's three dots, and you will see a drop down menu. You can either add, there's a plus button, or you can drag it, and it'll immediately ask you to, um, to create a perspective, create a name, and then uh, also a description for that perspective. And then you can uh, log, uh, tie that to your, uh, to Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn. So I would you know, strongly encourage, that's the biggest thing, I mean, creating perspectives now, if we can get uh, a critical mass of people doing that, then uh, we're starting to see some really good uptick on the creation of perspective, but. Um, and tell your friends. Tell your friends. So use it, that's, that's what we ask. Great, thank you, gentlemen. Um, I wanna invite Nate Olson up. Hey guys, um, I just wanna wrap us up today. Uh, Two years ago, I was lucky enough to be the co-creator of One Million Cups with um, my partner in crime, uh, Cameron Cushman, at the time. And um, when I look back on two years, it was funny, I was looking in the mirror this morning and I was like, dude, you look young. And I look back two years ago at the picture Kirk put up, I was like, wow, I was a baby and who in their right mind would let them run and create 
you know, a program. Um, but Tom was, I, I thanked Tom last year on a one year anniversary and I want to thank him again for allowing me to create and he said, here's the, here's the target, go. And um, so one thing I just want to say about this community and why it's special is we're in 32 communities. We have 132 entrepreneurs that work every single week to provide one million cups to their community. They're unpaid. Um, these people love community, but more than that, I think that they are kind of pioneers in creating the future of their communities. If you look back historically at the people who shaped Kansas cities, it was the entrepreneurs that did that. You know, it's Mr. K's legacy that, that we get to live out. And um, every time that we have entrepreneurs come across the stage, I think, who's going to be the next Mr. K, and who's shaping the community. Um, so that's one thing, is I think we are pioneering a program that is impacting so many other communities, because people are trying to figure out how to support entrepreneurs. So I just want to thank you for helping us turn in the last year. We've turned from just an event for entrepreneurs, where we had really about 60 to 70 percent entrepreneurs coming every week, to a program that's really about community and supporting the overall growth of the community. So that's incredible. Um, and I think the last thing I'll just say from a personal standpoint is um, the Kauffman Foundation, everyone who works here who's brilliant, Tom, Annette, Taylor, Taylor Brown, Nathan Kurtz, who are my teammates on One Million Cubs, Melissa Roberts, who's been amazing, everyone else here at Kauffman who helps to create the program, um, they've really given me the biggest learning experience I've ever had in my life. And it has, like I'm in love with this program, I'm in love with this community, I'm in love with all of the entrepreneurs that work to make this happen. So I just wanna say thank you to all of them, thank you for helping me grow along the way. And um, let's talk about One Million Cups 3.0 real quick. Um, so we listen to you guys. Uh, this program's been shaped by entrepreneurs um, and by the community and the needs. And since we are the pioneers, um, we don't know where the program's going. If we're being really honest, we don't know what this community needs in year three. So you guys need to tell us what you need. Um, we are all ears, we always have been. Um, some of the things that we're doing is we're, we're looking at a rebuild of the website. We're looking at what a mobile experience would look like. We're looking at how we can facilitate connections in our community that are really deep and meaningful beyond just a weekly event and turning it into really a community building platform. So we're heading in a really positive direction. We're going to be hopefully going global here later this year. Um, there's a lot of exciting opportunity here, um, but we want your feedback. And so One Million Cups 3.0 is really gonna be shaped by your feedback because everything that happens here, that we test here, goes to all of our other communities. Um, so anyway, I wanna get you guys out of here and go build companies and stuff, but um, thank you for everything, thank you for coming, and we really, really appreciate you. Thanks.